what does the general uh, electorate think about voting for a convicted felon or somebody still facing felony charges for president of the United States? I mean, this is a real issue that, quite frankly, I don't know whether Ron DeSantis and other Republicans just hope it goes away, whether they're waiting for a unicorn to come over the hill and rescue them from this. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is January 4th, 2024. We are coming up on the third anniversary of the January 6th insurrection, which is hanging fire at multiple levels of the legal system. In our uh, episodes of the Trump trials, we've been looking at the legal perils faced by the former president, but uh, they have never been as severe as they are today. And of course, we are joined by our good friend Ben Wittes from Lawfare. Ben, first of all, Happy New Year. Happy no. New Year to you. This is and and to everyone listening. Well, I've Buckle been a lot, people. Well, I've been I've been quoting you your conversation in the kitchen with Mona Charon at uh, New Year's party um, about the stakes here. I mean, it is it's one of those moments again, and I I think I've started every podcast this week by saying, you know, it is rare that as you go into a year. You are aware that you know this is the this is the hinge of fate. And I was thinking about you know knowing in January. I think maybe in January of 1944, people realized that this was the hinge of fate. But certainly that's true of 2024. So many things right on the knife's edge. Yeah, and and one of the things about it that gives it that choose your own adventure novel uh, quality, where you know, you actually do sort of know the list of possible outcomes. Mm -hmm. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't know, um, uh, which one you're going to get, but you kind of know the list. And the reason is that there's a democratic nominee for president and there's a Republican nominee for president and you 100% of the time since, you know, uh, uh, we became a two party system, you get one or the other. Yeah. And right now the probability that those two are, one is a small D democratic figure that is kind of roughly consistent with the American tradition. And the other is promising a radical break with the American, uh, democratic, uh, tradition, uh, uh, and promising something much more authoritarian. That is really, really stark and their ballot entry, or they're going to be ballot entries. And yeah. so you know a particular date on which we are going to make a choice mm -hmm. between those two. And you also know uh, a particular date, uh, New Year's New Year's Day uh, 2025, where the world might be very similar to the world today, or it might be really different from really the world different. today. You know what's also stark, though, as I was thinking about the third anniversary of, of January 6th, is how inconceivable this moment would have been on January 7th, 2021. You know, we start the week with that uh, poll that was in the Washington Post showing what percentage of Republicans, what percentage of Americans, frankly, don't really have a problem with what happened on January 6th. They're not only supporting Donald Trump. Um, and willing to minimize his role in that attempt to overturn the election, but are quite sympathetic to the people who attacked the, the, the Capitol. I guess, you know, Ben, we've been talking for the last, you know, seven years about, you know, being a, you know, post-fact um, society, post-fact political culture. I, I feel like we moved past that, sort of almost post-reality. Um, the success of the big lie in convincing tens of Americans, the the success of Donald Trump in his historical revisionism is really amazing. And I'm trying to think of any parallel to that in American history. And I'm coming up short. I mean, how amazing is it three years after that we are where we are right now? So I, 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 I want to reflect on that for a moment. Um, I, I really appreciated your conversation with Susan Glasser about it yesterday and um, about the degree of uh, sort of reality suspension mm -hmm. that is a kind of not predictable norm in, uh, you know, based on 
based on life in our lifetimes that you could convince, uh, you know, something like 40% of the American people yeah. that, you know, what an event they saw with their own eyes didn't happen. Um, look, I will point out that I, I don't remember the exact numbers in the poll, but this is not majority sentiment, right? right. It is, a, a, it is a, a strong minority sentiment mm -hmm. And it's a minority sentiment that correlates uh, quite precisely with a lot of other quite pathological beliefs. For example, uh, the beliefs that, um, you know, that Donald Trump should be president again, right? That, that, uh, uh, that, Donald Trump is a figure oppressed by the deep state, right. right? These are, these are kind of wild fantasies. And the fact that in the midst of a set of wild fantasies that have no basis in truth, we've now added a, yet another one that's, uh, you know, kind of a comprehensive wild fantasy that, you know, the event that disqualified him never really happened or right. was good or was, uh, you know, expression of patriotism. Uh, I cannot think of good exact corolla no. corollaries to this in American history, except one, which is the rewriting of what the civil war was. And, um, <laughs> you know, the, which is the, oddly the, relevant the, these days. The conversion of the Civil War from a rebellion of, against the United mm -hmm. States in defense of the privilege of slavery uh, for, for, you know, white Southern landowners into the lost cause, right? And into that, that, that was a, a, it's a good analogy. A, an in, intellectual transition that happened over, uh, you know, a few, you know, started over a few months and mm -hmm. became uh, a kind of uh, national mythology in 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 the South uh, uh, over a few years, and and you know persists to some de de degree, as Nikki Haley reflects. And and I do think that that there's a um, there's some analogy to be drawn there. The difference, of course, is that it is not the the, the in, in defense of the lost cause, um, <laughs> you know, it was not a cult of personality around no, one person. No. And it was not about uh, one person's uh, uh, will to power. It was it was much more about – it was about other horrible things, but it wasn't about, that's, you that's know, excellent. Jefferson yeah. Davis's uh, right. uh, efforts to seize power after the Civil War or no, Robert that, E. Lee's, yeah. right? The, the, no, that, that that is an excellent analogy. The one that I was thinking about was, you know, the, you know, and, and you point out that this is not a majority point of view, um, but it is a substantial minority. But uh, even though it's a it's a substantial minority, it also has one of the two major political parties in its grips, and that political party um, may be on the brink of of uh, of power in Washington D.C. This would be a little bit like you know we, we've dealt with conspiracy theorists all of our lives. You know, people who thought that the moon landing was fake or that the CIA assassinated uh, John F. Kennedy. Um, it, but but imagine one of the major political parties suddenly you know seizing that as a litmus test, as a as one of the tenets of belief. That's how weird it is to me. Um, what's happened with 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 January six, which makes it so, so, so much more exponentially dangerous. There is one other analogy, but it's not an American history analogy, and that's the beer hall putsch. Um, right. And so. You know, for those whose early Nazi history is is yeah. uh, you know not conversant, uh, in I believe 1925, uh, uh, Hitler, the you know the leader of the then mm -hmm. uh, new Nazi Party, mm -hmm. tried to uh, overthrow the Weimar Republic. Um, or maybe it was 23 actually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, tried to overthrow the, the the new Weimar Republic. It was something of a riot in mm -hmm. in a Munich beer hall, and it was uh, putatively led by uh, General Ludendorff, who had been the sort of commander in chief of the German forces during World War One. Um, was actually led by Adolf Hitler, um, and the you know Hitler was tried and sentenced. Uh, uh, 
did time for, for treason during which he wrote Mein Kampf and he converted this rebellion uh, into sort of a great patriotic uprising and, and uh, um, uh, Mein Kampf, the book was a kind of apologia, not, you know, written mm-hmm. from prison for among other things, this, uh, th- this abortive uprising. Um, and I do think the conversion of that and into, you know, a great patriotic moment, which is what he did and, and did rather successfully over time provides sort of some analogy to what Trump is trying to do in, uh, with the conversion of this great moment of shame and anti- specifically anti-democratic shame um, into, uh, you know, a patriotic, you know, choirs of, of, of um, you know, prisoners um, and as, the opposed to a shambolic, as opposed to a shambolic, bloody um, fiasco, uh, failed coup d'etat. By the way, for our history buffs, um, this was um, November 8th and 9th, 1923. So uh, yeah, about so, a century ago. And so, I, look, I don't I, – I, Hitler analogies are always bad. Right, yeah. um, and so I don't I don't want to – I don't want to dwell on that one. Um, I do think at a time where Trump is, you know, quite self-consciously invoking Hitlerian rhetoric um, and it, it's not not a good idea to – remember that there are abortive putches and and mm-hmm. uh uprisings that become valorized in right wing or for that matter left wing um mythologies there are certainly you know uh, uh um and so I think the, the the better example in American history is probably no. the Civil War. Well, okay, so these come these all come together, you know, coup d'etats and 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 insurrection. Because let's dive into the big stories. I mean, we've been doing this for some time. You know, the Trump trials. Um, you know, many of them having to do with, in in comparison, the minutiae of various um, motions and hearings and everything. We have moved right into the Super Bowl right now. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court um, almost certainly. Feel free to disagree with me. It's going to be taking up the 14th Amendment, Section 3 litigation. Uh, Donald Trump uh, has, and I think correctly, um, said this is an issue of national importance and uh, has to be decided by the Supreme Court. So let's start with the so-called insurrectionist clause, since there were developments yesterday um, um, related to Section 3, which very explicitly bars people from serving in office if they had sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution and then participate in an insurrection. Uh, since you and I spoke last, Colorado Supreme Court uh, ruled uh, during my vacation, weirdly enough, um, both of our vacations, uh, that Trump is constitutionally ineligible to run um, because uh, that section covers his conduct uh, during the attack on the Capitol. Uh, Secretary of State was ordered not to place his name on the ballot. Then on December 28th, Maine, the Secretary of State ruled that Trump's name must be removed from the primary um, ballot. So they have gone now to the Supreme Court and um, they are um, basically saying, all right, we want the nine members of the U.S. Supreme Court to decide whether or not Donald Trump can remain on the ballot. So, Ben, give, give me your take on Colorado, Maine, and whether you think the Supreme Court is going to take up this case. Well, I want to take you back, Charlie, to a conversation that we had on this podcast. I remember exactly where I was when we had it, which was in the airport in Reykjavik, Iceland. That's um, memorable. And, um, <laughs> and we were talking about this, uh, these obscure litigations. And I said, you know, watch this space. This is going to be a big deal. And uh, the reason it's going to be a big deal is because one state, I think we were talking about Minnesota at mm-hmm. the time that the Minnesota Supreme Court was thinking about it. And I said, look, one state is going to do this. And the moment one state does it, the Supreme Court has to resolve it because, you know, you can't have Trump ineligible for service in Colorado, but, you know, in Wyoming, he's you know, can, like mm-hmm. that, th- this is yeah. actually an issue in which federal law has to be uniform. Mm-hmm. Um, and so 
if you'd asked me which state I thought was the likely one for for this, I'm not sure I would have picked Colorado. Uh, the Colorado Supreme Court, I thought, did a very creditable job laying out the case that the Constitution does, in fact, prohibit uh, Donald Trump's future service. That, by the way, there's a there's a lot of uh, a lot of people are dismissing this as a bunch of liberal judges. But yeah. that is the position of in the conservative world, people like David French, people like right. Mike Ludig, people like um, you know uh, uh, Will Bode and Mike Paulson. Mm. This is not Serious a trivial. People. Right. It's very serious people. It is not a trivial argument. And by the way, if you are a textualist or an originalist who takes seriously what the Constitution says, you know, take a moment to read Section 3 because it sure does seem to be describing somebody like Donald Trump. Um, that said, this is contrary to what a lot of liberals think. It is not a slam dunk no. at all. Um, and there are, I think, four distinct and serious questions that the Supreme Court would have to resolve all in the same direction in order to get to, um, uh, in order to get to affirming the Colorado Supreme Court. So the first is, is section three of the 14th Amendment, um, self-executing, which is a term that basically means does it do what it purports to do by itself, or does it require that Congress somehow implement it? Um, some so, so, for, are, so, for example, um, if Barack Obama wanted to run for president next year, um, he is barred by the Constitution from having a third term. That doesn't require an act of Congress or, a, you know, something to say, no, you can't be on the ballot, right? I mean, you just go to a court. Right, and, I'll, right. I'll, Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, there are provisions of the Constitution that do not execute themselves. And for and uh, and by the way, the 14th Amendment contains a bunch of such yeah. provisions. So the section, I forget whether it's four or five of the the last line of the 14th Amendment, I think it's section five, mm -hmm. uh, says – uh, Congress shall have power to effectuate by appropriate legislation the provisions right. of this. So, you know, so the, 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 the 14th Amendment itself names Congress as having a role in creating the, the legislation that enacts, th that does the work. Right now, due process and um, equal protection in 14th Amendment Section 1, we don't wait for Congress to enact that. Right. It, it's self-executing. Right. But the question of which provisions are and aren't self-executing uh, is a tricky one. And um, the court would have to rule that the 14th Amendment, Section 3, is self-executing. Second, the court would have to rule that the presidency is an office under the under the United States and that the president is an officer under the United States. I don't want to get into the minutiae of this that question. That seems kind of easy to me, but so it's easy commonsensically. Yeah, it's right. less easy legally. Oh, I'm um, sorry to hear that. And um, <laughs> it's um, and I mean we can dive into the reasons if you want to. I actually don't think it's a very interesting question. No, I don't think so either. But, but, <laughs> but it's yeah, a, but it is a really important question, and it's the one that, by the way, the district court in Colorado I know. tripped up on and said. You know, yeah, he engaged in an insurrection, but I don't think this provision applies to the presidency. And there's some reason to uh, – even the the Supreme Court of Colorado kind of struggled with it a little bit. They said – they basically said this would lead to an absurdity, which is right. It does yeah. lead to an absurdity. Right. But uh, sometimes, the you know, application of the Constitution to certain facts leads to absurdity. So you'd have to get past that. That's ball of questions number two. Um, ball questions number three is, um, was January 6th an insurrection within the meaning of the Constitution? Right. Um, and here, I, I find this question easy, actually. A lot of people do not. Mm -hmm. And the, and I'm, I'm including again, serious people. And the argument goes something like this. Um, Hey, we have a statute that defines insurrection and that's, mm -hmm. you know, Congress has the authority to enact to, you know, to, uh, 
to create enabling legislation and uh, uh, self, you know, execution legislation for this. And it did. It created an insurrection statute. Trump has not been indicted under that statute. Nobody's been charged in connection with January 6th under that statute, reflecting the fact that maybe this is not an insurrection within the technical definition of federal criminal law. Um, I think this is wrong um, because I think the, the question in the Constitution is not have you been charged with or has anybody been charged with insurrection or have you been convicted of it? The question in the Constitution is, did you do it? And uh, it doesn't, by the way, spell out how you figure the, right. out the answer to that question. But the question is not a question that sounds in criminal law. It's a question that sounds in objective reality. And I think the objective reality is that Donald Trump did something that seems awfully like lead an insurrection. And that brings me to the fourth question, which is, did he engage in it? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, let's, let's assume, for example, that the riot was a insurrection within the meaning of the Constitution. Um, Donald Trump did not participate in the riot, right? He didn't storm yeah. the Capitol himself. He actually didn't order anybody to storm yeah. the Capitol. Uh, and what he did do is he made an inflammatory speech and he praised people. Uh, there's a series of things that he did that you would have the court, the Supreme court would have to be convinced collectively amounted to engaging in insurrection. So my point isn't that the, the, this argument, f like that any of these questions, the answer to them favors Donald Trump. I actually think the, probably the best reading of the constitution is that he's barred, but yeah, I do think but. you, you'd ha you have to get through all four of them and they all have to cut the same direction and you have to get five justices to agree with that. Um, so I, th I do think it's a pretty heavy lift at the Supreme court that said, I don't believe that it is a 0% chance. Um, I, I do. I think, well, let me, let me, okay. let me, <laughs> let me mm -hmm. put yourself in the shoes of Neil Gorsuch. Okay. Um, your whole claim to legitimacy as a justice is originalism. Yeah. And is taking the text of the constitution seriously and the text of statute seriously irrespective of where they lead you politically. And so that means this is a guy who, though he's, you know, I, I don't think he's no kind of lefty. He will vote that, that, you know, section, uh, that, that, uh, title seven anti-discrimination law right. covers, uh, uh, trans and, 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 uh, uh, and gay people who were clearly not on the minds of the people who wrote it because that's what the text in his view says, uh, by the way, rightly, I think, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, he also is the best friend of, uh, the Indian tribes, uh, on the court because of, uh, first of all, a sensitivity, I think being from that part of the country, um, to some of their, uh, 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 but all, you know, some of their grievances, but also that he reads Indian law seriously, and and he takes what Congress said and you know wants to apply it. How does a guy like that look at a section like Section Three and say, no, for prudential reasons, you know, all of this? All this, uh, yeah, yeah, it seems to bar Donald Trump, but we just can't go there. So, right. th th um, that's, and I, that's, yeah. I, and I even think there's some of that you might see, like, I think that's going to be a problem for him. I don't know if it's going to be a problem for Clarence Thomas and Sam Alito, yeah. but I do think the more originalist you are, the more difficult this problem gets. And that's why you see some very prominent originalist scholars like, like Bode and Paulson, mm -hmm. who Jay write Bode. a piece that says, you know, this isn't really a close question. 
Okay, so here's here's my take as 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 a non lawyer here, um, because I, and I agree with everything you just you just said. However, um, you know, you look at the history of the court and the the intersection of the law and politics. It has always been a factor for the court, and you know that the Supreme Court hates to inject itself into these highly partisan toxic issues. They certainly do not. Justice Roberts and actually no one in this court wants to go through another Bush v. Gore type situation. And this is, I would say, exponentially more complex than than that. And so, right. yes, you know, th- this this does pose a challenge to the originalists, like, for example, uh, Gorsuch, which is why I think it's, um, I'm going to get, I'm going, I'm going to come back to this, but there are, look, the justices have all sorts of ways of kicking something or ruling narrowly or finding technicalities or other issues rather than dealing it. There is and 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 I'm 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 actually willing to die on this hill. I just I, I think there's a little bit of wish casting. There's a little bit of unicorn hunting here. There is no way that this U.S. Supreme Court is going to throw Donald Trump off the ballot in the middle of a presidential election year. No court wants to take a step that would be perceived as that radical. Um, I don't think it's extreme. I agree with you. Um, whatever your definition of 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 insurrection is, I believe that inciting and stoking um, and conspiring to have the violent overthrow of a free and fair election is is insurrection. I do believe that the 14th Amendment does apply. However, you know, in the real world, in the prudent world, Supreme Court justices just do not want to play that role. Um, and so I just don't think that there's any way that, that is, that's, going, that's going to happen. I do wonder whether there's any sort of interplay. And again, we're talking about things that we do not know between this ruling and the ruling um, on the question of presidential immunity, because that is, to me, and you and I have talked about this, that's the big one. This question of whether or not the president is is immune. I've always expected the court would reject Donald Trump's claims of immunity. In some ways, they have now the opportunity to balance, say, no, we're not going to throw him off the ballot, but we are also not going to say that he is immune. That strikes me, if, if I'm Justice Roberts, from a political legal point of view, that seems like a sweet spot. But what do I know? What do any of us know? Right. So since we last talked about this case, there have actually been very substantial developments right. in it. And um, the most important is that the Supreme Court said, no, we're not going to hear it right. uh, as a preliminary yeah. matter. Mm-hmm. Follow the regular order. D.C. Circuit, go first. Um, that is a significant development. Uh either because it signals that the Supreme Court's not that interested in this subject um, and may not take it at all, or because it adds a layer of delay, one or the other. Um, uh, In the meantime, the D.C. Circuit had set a lightning fast briefing schedule. Yeah, looks like they're going to get that done. Yeah, The briefing is now all done and it is going to be argued on Tuesday. Um, And so, you know, by the time we do Trump trials next week, uh, we could even have a ruling from the D.C. Circuit. Seriously? Uh, Well, that fast. you know, I (laughs) think it's going to be very fast. You Mm -hmm. don't set a briefing schedule that fast in order to dawdle on the uh, on on the answer. And so when the D.C. Circuit rules, let's say by mid-January, um then one of two things happens. Either the Supreme Court then has to take it up or mm. lose its chance to do so right. before conviction. Yeah. Or um, it declines to do it. And then we're back in trial land. Right. You know, I don't know. We may be not for March 4th, which is where, uh, but there's no reason why t- Judge Chutkin couldn't do it in March if you know, if the Supreme Court punts uh, again. And so, you know, I think the D.C. Circuit is sending a very clear signal here that um, this trial is not going to not happen in a timely fashion because of us. If the Supreme Court wants to slow this down and push it deeper into an election year, that's on them. Mm-hmm. Um, but the 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 judges of the DC circuit, God bless them, are saying, uh, we understand the need for expeditious resolution of the immunity question. 
All right. So on Tuesday, Trump's legal team filed that that brief in support of, you know, uh, granting immunity. And it, it's it is quite, as we say, an audacious argument they're they're making. Uh, he's claiming he's absolutely immune from prosecution for actions he took while in office. And his lawyers cite the impeachment judgment clause in Article one, which reads, Judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, uh, trust or profit under the United States. But the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment and punishment according to law. So the clause indicates that a party convicted can still face prosecution. Trump, (laughs) I'm sorry to laugh, but Trump is arguing that the clause means something even more that the president who is not convicted by impeachment may not be subject to prosecution. This strikes me as kind of a high lob um, in terms of absurdity. What do you think? Well, I want to preface this, Charlie, by saying I'm the guy who always says, actually, wait, let's give the devil his due Mm -hmm. and take this argument seriously. Not this time. This is a freaking stupid argument. (laughs) And uh, I think the D.C. Circuit will treat it as frivolous. Um, The Constitution's – literally nobody until this litigation has ever ever (laughs) thought that this is what – that this is what the impeachment judgment clause means. Uh, There is no scholarly support for it. Um, I, I have spent time with this clause since the, the Clinton impeachment in, you know, in, in 1998, 1999. Um, and, uh, nobody thought that Clinton could not be charged having been qu- acquitted in impeachment. Nobody thought that, um, about, uh, um, Uh, No one's ever argued that before. Uh, This has no votes at the Supreme Court. It has no votes at the D.C. Circuit. Okay. Unlike the claim of presidential immunity, which is a different and more substantial claim uh, that uh, some people are not taking seriously enough. Yeah. Okay. So let's get to that. Jack Smith has been uh, pushing back very, very hard um, uh, against, for example, you know, Trump's opening brief that was filed back in December. Um, if Trump's argument is correct that he's immune, Smith's team told the court, a president could order the National Guard to kill critics, tell the FBI to plant evidence, or take bribes for government contracts. In each of these scenarios, the president could assert that he was simply executing the laws or communicating with the Department of Justice or discharging his powers as commander in chief. And Trump's approach would leave no recourse to deter a president from inciting his supporters during a State of the Union address to kill opposing lawmakers, thereby hamstringing any impeachment proceeding to ensure that he remains in office unlawfully. Uh, Trump also pointed out that Trump had previously argued in the Stormy Daniels case that presidential immunity expired when a president leaves office. Okay, so you think that some folks are not taking this seriously because I think that this is a very clear, bright line for the Supreme Court to say, no, you are not immune, because if they ruled the contrary way, we would live in a completely different constitutional universe. So what are we not taking seriously enough? OK, so first of all, let me distinguish between several different types of immunity claims by presidents. Uh, one the easiest question to address is the question of absolute immunity that Trump has addressed, uh, has argued for. This is uh, uh, clearly wrong for a lot of the reasons yeah. that um, that uh, uh, the the hypotheticals in the special counsel's brief, written undoubtedly by the. Uh, redoubtable Michael Dreeben, who is one of the the finest uh, appellate criminal lawyers in the history of the country. Um, And uh, I don't need to say more than the the, uh, hypotheticals that you just quoted um, to say, okay, it cannot be that the president is absolutely immune uh, in the way that he is, by the way, absolutely immune from civil liability Mm -hmm. under Nixon v. Fitzgerald. Um, That leaves a question that um, is 
much harder, which is, is there some non-absolute immunity that covers the president? You know, a cop gets, uh, gets qualified immunity famously, right? Um, uh, for stuff within his line of duty. Uh, Trump is not asking for qualified immunity. Uh, I do not think like, I think that is actually a tricky question. The reason he's not asking for qualified immunity is because it's not good enough to hmm. protect him, right? Really? You know, if, if you give Trump qualified immunity, um, uh, he's, you know, Jack Smith can overcome that um, huh. with the, the, the power of this evidence. The third thing, and this is the area where I think the issue is very hard, is the – so the federal government, even as it argues that Trump does not have immunity, absolute immunity in this context, has a long line of arguments that you can't apply certain criminal laws to the president. Um, for example um, – uh, there are um, uh, the Office of Legal Counsel has a longstanding rule that says unless a um, a statute specifically says that it does apply to the president, a criminal statute, you you as a prudential matter assume that it doesn't. Right. If its application to the president could in some way impede the presidential function. Right. So let me give you an example. If I purported to send military troops overseas uh, to accomplish some objective of Ben Wittes's, I would be probably charged with conspiracy to commit murder, or, mm -hmm. you know, um, right? But if the president does that, it you would never think of – of uh, applying the conspiracy to commit murder to the activity, the lawful activity, otherwise lawful activity of the, the commander in chief in his capacity as commander in chief. That set of questions is another way of saying immunity, right? When, when you don't apply criminal statutes to the president because he's his function is different, right? right? He has right. certain, he has certain articulated constitutional functions. And um, so I think Jack Smith clearly with a lot of input from OLC has done a remarkable job of distinguishing between these different threads. Um, and, you know, his basic position before judge Chutkin was we have all kinds of ways to protect the president um, the plain, clear statement rule that I just referred to, uh, prudential application of non-application of certain statutes to the presidency. By the way, if you're going to recognize an immunity, qualified immunity, there's no reason to give him absolute immunity, right. give him qualified immunity, right? So the question of how the Supreme Court will think about the immunities of the president in criminal cases is a very that's a very hard set of questions. It's not a hard set of questions as to whether the immunity that Trump is claiming is our well, and that's are the question, valid though, or right? would be recognized. I mean, it, the, the, the question is whether or not the court will say that Trump is immune from prosecution for the conduct for which he's been charged. And if I'm hearing you correctly, there are there is a qualified immunity that would not cover the specific charges that Jack Smith has brought against him. Well, so you could imagine the Supreme Court saying we don't recognize the qualif the the absolute immunity that the president has right. asked for. We do think the president is entitled to qualified immunity in the following right. fashion and we remand the case to the district court to figure out whether the indictment is defective in light of that. Right? And I, that would surprise me if they did it, but it wouldn't like it wouldn't, you know, rock my world particularly. The reason they are not asking for for that is because hmm. it wouldn't do the work they need. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about the, another recent development in the bulwark today. Um, Kim Whaley, who actually is is a lawyer, is pointing out that Trump's lawyers, who are all officers of the court, are arguing in their final brief, basically using the big lie in in their briefs that when Trump. 
was carrying out his supposed duties um, as president, that there were, quote, they are vigorous disputes and questions about the outcome of the 2020 election, and that there was, quote, extensive information about widespread fraud and irregularities in the 2020 election. She says, look, these have all been refuted. These are clearly lies and says, you know, the these are so the, the, the falsehoods are so egregious. The lawyers should be sanctioned for misconduct for including those falsehoods in their brief. But it is rather extraordinary that what Trump is now doing in his defense or his lawyers on his behalf are, in fact, invoking the big lie to justify his behavior. So speaking of audacious, your reaction. Yeah, so, well, so this is a, uh, a, a problem as, a, as an initial matter that Judge Chutkin's going to have to deal with because the only real defense of Donald Trump, and it only gets you part of the way, but yeah. let's – but right. any, if you're a defense lawyer who's going to defend Donald Trump, mm -hmm. this has got to be part of your defense, right? He he genuinely believed okay. the the bullshit that he was right. propagating. Uh, he um, that was not simply self serving motivated reasoning. Mm -hmm. There was some good faith reason for him to believe that, and here's why he believed it. Now, once you go down that road, you're propagating the big lie, right? You're, you're yeah. saying, hey, you know, he actually believed this and there were good reasons to believe it. Well, actually, there weren't good reasons to believe it. There was no reason to believe any of it except motivated reasoning that it might keep you in power. And so it puts you in a very difficult position as a defense lawyer where, you know, the the best defense of your client is to uh, is to propagate the same fraudulent nonsense that he was propagating, that he's, by the way, charged with, among other things, fraud for propagating. Right, right, right. And you have to be ex – so from a – I don't want to sound entirely unsympathetic to, to his lawyers here. They're ethically obliged to make the most vigorous defense for him that they can consistent with other okay. obligations – and so I, I – but it's a really fine line they have to walk because they're not allowed to lie to the court. They're not allowed to, uh, you know, make arguments that uh, that have no reasonable factual basis, No, right? There are constraints on their ability to do it, and there's a very narrow path that they can walk here. Uh, in 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 the pursuit of those things. Okay, so um, I, because it's the new year, I, I forget who I'm quoting here, but this whole question of what Trump actually believed and its relevance, didn't Jack Smith make the point that um, Trump's state of mind really doesn't, you know, d does not absolve him? So for example, if I believe that the bank made a mistake on my account, I am not therefore justified in robbing the bank. Or if I go in and I hold up the bank, you know, and take $100,000 out, it would not be a legitimate defense for me to say that I genuinely believe that they had made an accounting error on my account, right? I mean, so that, that does so not wipe that away is, the crime. That whatever, is exactly, whatever I thought, no matter how sincere my belief was. That is exactly why I uh, started by saying uh, it is not an it is not an adequate defense to say that he sincerely believed this, but that any defense you might muster would have to include that, right? You, It has to have other elements too, because there are some things he did like, you know, just getting on the phone with Brad Raffensperger and threatening him. Right. You're not allowed to issue threats just because you legitimately believe that you're right on the merits. By the way, a bank – over the weekend uh, did make a huge accounting error to my detriment. Mm -hmm. um, and I discovered it uh, on January 1st and it sent me into a murderous rage. Mm -hmm. And this is true, by the way, it's it, rational it, it was response, many, yeah. many, th it was thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it sent me in a murderous rage and the law deterred me from doing something that I might otherwise have done involving buildings and, Property damage and you know <laughs> injuries to people on this the is phone reassuring. who were not. So I I I do want to your your example hits home. 
Well, I'm I'm glad to hear, by the way, that your your restraint and I was also probably fortunate <laughs> that, that the banks were closed on January first. So it was a, yes, it was a and bank on holiday. January, and on January third, which is to say yesterday, on January second, I wrote them a very very angry note, uh, demanding that this be corrected. And uh, yesterday, they acknowledged error and oh, that's uh, are, are restoring and the, my and money. The money is, and the money is back. So one other development. Let, let's just veer off into the area of, of speculation. But something else happened when you and I were both on vacation. Uh, we got that report out of Michigan, uh, the story of more tapes. Lordy, there were more tapes of Donald Trump urging members of the Elections Commission, Elections Board there, not to certify the election. Um, we don't know how many tapes there are out there, but... You know, is is this the kind of thing? For, first of all, do you think Jack Smith already knew about that? And if he didn't know about it, is this something that's going to be folded into the prosecutions? What do you think? So I assume that the federal government um, has access to, you know, the, the the investigation here has been so broad and so intense, and the powers of the federal government to get information are, you know, so powerful that I. My working assumption is that these things that may not have been previously known to the public may well have been previously known to Jack Smith, uh, who's had a, you know, now three year between the Justice Department pre special counsel and the Office of Special Counsel. It's about a three years of investigation. That said, you know, um, not, not always the case. And, you know, um, Remember that Leon Jaworski learned about, or, or, or Archibald Cox, to be precise, learned about the Watergate tapes from congressional hearings, right? Like, you know, there are always surprises, and it wouldn't entirely surprise me if uh, this were one of them. Yeah. Uh, as to how it fits into the case, I, I don't we know. Don't. Well, we are now moving into warp speed, though, as I think you've uh, you've you've laid out in terms of of the calendar. We're going to see what the uh, D.C. Circuit does, what the Supreme Court does. These are huge decisions coming down. We may be having a trial as early as March. I thought it was very interesting um, in the twilight of Ron DeSantis's campaign. I highlighted this in my newsletter this morning. Um, NBC reporter Vaughn Hilliard goes up to uh, Governor DeSantis and says, so if Donald Trump is in fact convicted of a felony and wins the nomination, would you still stand behind him at the convention? And Ron DeSantis, brave Ron DeSantis, brave Sir Ron, ran away, would not even answer the, 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 the question. And of course, this is again one of the unknowns of 2024. What does the Republican Party um, and more importantly, what does the general uh, electorate think about voting for a convicted felon or somebody still facing felony charges for president of the United States. I mean, this is a real issue that, quite frankly, I don't know whether Ron DeSantis and other Republicans just hope it goes away, whether they're waiting for a unicorn to come over the hill and rescue them from this. But again, this is going to be one of the big questions of 2024. Want to be, you know, not just the legal outcome, but the political reaction to the legal outcome. Yeah, I, I actually think the legal outcome is more certain in my mind mm. than the political than than is that question, the political reaction to the legal outcome. Uh, on the one hand, I, I I've watched you know federal criminal cases my entire adult life, and so I feel like I have a a, a really large end sample of what federal prosecutors are and aren't capable mm -hmm. of what, how juries behave, how judges behave. Like, I feel like the judicial systems handling of the case of Donald Trump is a relatively predictable, you know, some genuine variables, some yeah. genuine uncertainties, juries. but, yeah. but we have a lot to compare it to in terms of, other high profile criminal cases, the way the justice, we know how the justice department behaves, right? How the, how the f electorate responds to the conviction of a presidential candidate whom it has just nominated <clears throat> is a matter of about which we have no N no. sample. Nope. It's an N of zero. Um, <laughs> and you know, unless you count Eugene Debs, who um, uh, not quite was the, uh, not a good not a good analogy, um, uh, and I do think that every prediction that has been made about um, 
the balloon bursting based on some event that's going to be three months from now has been wrong. Right. And so we should, we should not assume that we can predict with any confidence uh, what the effect of, of, of a criminal conviction would be, except in one very limited sense, right? There is, which is the following. There is, I think no person in America who is, who right now it is unthinkable that they would vote for Donald Trump. But if you convict him, they'd be like, all right, now, now I'm going to vote for him. Right. So there, there's no upside. Yeah. There's no political upside to being convicted. Um, and similarly, I think it is safe to say that the bottom will not fall out of Trump's support. There's a core, his core base is going to support him even if he's locked up. Uh, and so the question really is what, what is the swing? Is the swing 1%? Is the swing 7%? Right? There's some, there's some group of people who right now say, okay, I could vote for Donald Trump. Right. Who, if he were a convicted felon, would not say that and would either stay home or would write in, you know, uh, uh, you know, somebody else or would even vote for Biden. Um, I think the, the, the meat of the question is what is that, that percentage? Is it a, is it, and is it a percentage that takes Trump from the department of running even with Biden to the department of being completely unelectable or is it smaller than that? And no one knows the answer to that. And all of the polls that, that that measure that, I, I don't, I don't think are predictive in that sense because we don't know. There are the many things that you think. Well, if this happens, this will be the reaction. This will be my reaction. When it actually happens, it's completely different. Um, but to your point, we have and, we've and- been waiting for that moment, and every time it comes the window moves. People say, well, if this happened, if he got indicted, absolutely not. Well, okay, no. What about this? What about this? What about this? So I, I still, I I still envision that, that moment at the Milwaukee convention where he steps out from, you know, behind the podium, pulls his pants leg up, shows the ankle bracelet (laughs) on him and says, I wear this as a badge of honor. I wear this for you. And the place goes absolutely out of its mind. So I want to I want to add one thing that there's another moment um that may be just as important as the moment of conviction which is the moment of sentencing. Mm. And Donald Trump will not be in jail by he he will no. almost certainly receive an appellate bond. Sure. Um and by the way should in my view right. I don't I don't think Correct. He, um but he could very well be sentenced in one or more cases. Now, the the sentence that he would get if he were convicted in the January 6th case would be lengthy. Um, and, you know, you can rack up a lot of time by trying to overthrow the United States government. Um, and so imagine people talk about the moment of conviction, but there's a moment at which Judge Chutkin would, assuming he were convicted, look at him having... It's, it's probably three months after sentencing, uh, after conviction. She's gotten the pre-sentence report. She's weighed wow, she's right all in the, the middle of the campaign. Okay, go on. Right. Yeah. And she's going to look him in the eye and say, I find that you did this with uh, in abandonment of your oath, in selfish, blah, blah. She's going to make some really dramatic not dramatic because she's a drama queen or anything, but dramatic because the facts are dramatic. And she's going to say, and I sentence you to serve X amount of years in prison. And that that's a pretty interesting moment too. <laughs> um, yeah, that's pretty interesting. I think that'd be an, un- that's the understatement of today's podcast. Pretty interesting. You know? So I, I, I just, uh, but again, is it, is it a is it a powerful moment that causes nobody to abandon him? Is it a powerful moment that causes one percent to abandon him? Is it a powerful moment that causes ten percent? Nobody, you know, nobody has any idea what the answer to those questions are. 
No, I, and I and I think that's that is an important point because we go into all of this, and I think there are certain um, assumptions about the way things are going to play out, and there are so many variables because. As you point out, there are absolutely no precedents. There's no historical uh, parallel that we can that we can draw. On. Ben Wittes, thank you so much for joining me again on uh, the latest edition of Trump Trials. Hey, we will Charlie, be back. Yes, Ben. We're going to be back next week, and we're going to do this all over again. Uh, we we haven't gotten to say that in a while. We are going to do this all over again. In fact, thank you all for listening to the Bulwark Podcast because I will be back tomorrow, and I'll do this all over again.